You're listening to The Dental Guys. This is part two of our interview with Chris Mahan of Mahan and Associates. And in this part, we get really dived down into the details, the numbers, the brass tacks, the things that really you should be tracking on a daily basis to know where you stand and how your practice is really doing. This is going to be something where you pull your notebook out, you take notes, and you make sure that you're on the right track on this episode of The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Well, welcome to this episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And uh, we are here again in Wes's uh, studio getting to record together for this, which is rare, so it's always fun to get to do that. And, uh, you know, we're continuing on with uh, our discussion with Chris Mahan, uh, uh, just really diving deeper in this episode into specific numbers. Uh, what should we be tracking? What should we be looking at? And really, I think most dentists actually do love this part. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a hard time. We, as dentists, have a hard time maybe uh, uh, talking about business, but we all want to know where we stand. We all mm -hmm. want to know how we compare. We all want to know if we're doing well. And, uh, you know, Chris is going to help us understand what we should be looking at in our practices. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to talk a little bit about some uh, really pretty cool thing that, that's coming up. And, uh, you know, we have had a lot of discussion about um, courses that people want to, to see us to, to see us teach, mm -hmm. um, that, um, they've been asking and asking, cause we talk so much about, uh, about implant dentistry. And as you guys know, you know, we're, we're teaching some things with restorative driven implants, which has been awesome. It's been super successful. It's been so much fun to get to be involved with, you know, teaching new dentists how to place and restore implants with a systematized approach. I mean, you know, that's how we're going to roll if you've listened to the show, but, um, we, Wes and I, are going to be teaching course that's really near and dear to our hearts, which is on full arch prosthetics with implants. This is something that that we've been doing for a long time, and but we but to teach it, it's a pretty it's daunting. It's a lot of information, but everybody, man, not a, I mean, a ton of people want to learn how to do it well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, Wes. Talk a little bit about what are people going to learn in this course? Uh, it's coming up in May. Mm. Um, you can, if you just, first of all, you can go to restorative, restorative driven implants.com slash specialized. If you mm -hmm. want to go directly to where this course is, if you just go to restorative driven implants.com, you'll see some specialized one day courses. Okay. John, you talk about a value. Yeah. I mean, like a one day course that gives you the amount of information that we're going to pack into this eight to five session. Yeah. May 8th, mark the date. Let me tell you right now, like whenever... Whenever I looked at our outline that we put together and I was drafting up the the hands-on and the didactic version yeah. of like what we're going to tackle, oh my. It's pretty much it's, everything. It's everything you can imagine. Like you're going to come away like with a really good understanding of how to restoratively drive, mm -hmm. right, your surgical procedures. Right. Even if you're not a surgeon, you're going to know, hey, how do I set this case up before I walk in and place an implant or instruct a surgeon on where right. to put my this, implants? This course is designed not for surgery. This is for restorative. But in order to, to know how to do the prosthetics, you have to start off with treatment planning. That's right. You have to start off with how many implants do we need for full arch? Yeah, you know, there's a big debate about like, okay, how many implants do I need to place mm -hmm. in the maxilla? How mm -hmm. many implants do I need? Is like, is all on four, you know, this coin term, is right. that really is that all enough? on four, three on none? You hear that, right? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about like what we like, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to that. If you want to understand the most modern mm -hmm. approach 
to full arch fixed prosthetics, including zirconia hybrids, yep. bar wrapped in acrylic. Yeah, we're talking about bar wrapped in acrylic in this course, John, because I feel like that people just poo poo it because there are prosthetic complications with sure. all of these. It's not as sexy. It's not as sexy, but we're also going to talk about moving from teeth to implants over time. Yeah, yeah. Full arch dentistry when it comes to implants is moving beyond the dentition. Mm-hmm into something either fixed or removable, John. We're going to talk about removable as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really at the end of this, you should be able to not only understand you know, the treatment planning, um, the steps involved, you know, how many implants are necessary, but really the, the step-by-step. So there'll be you know, every appointment of restoring a, a full arch zirconia prosthesis, a full arch bar an acrylic prosthesis is going to be demonstrated, discussed, mm-hmm. and then a hands-on uh, demonstration. So we'll actually you'll you'll get to understand how to do a conversion, the conversion prosthesis, mm. immediately things, loading hybrids. right? Yeah, how to do immediate loading, how to take impressions, how to do verification, uh, how to deal with wax rims, how to how to how to go from start to finish with some of the the parts that are the most complicated. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that we find is that you look at these, everybody wants to know how to do these because they're, they're a ton of fun and they're life changing. Mm-hmm. But, um, man, if you mess up the, uh, the mistakes cost you big time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's why a lot of people don't do them. Uh, it's also going to be pretty awesome because we'll get to be, uh, taking this course at, a lab facility. Let's talk about a venue right here. Yeah. Like we're talking about, so we're gracious that uh, the dental guys are sponsored by, I mean, the Dental Crafters Network. Right, And right. we're going to actually go to their home base. Yeah. And they have a brand new educational facility there. Unbelievable. State of the art. Unbelievable. This is amazing opportunity for you to actually not only get to take a course um, from the dental guys, but also you get to be at a facility, mm-hmm. right? You know what I want to do, John? I want to, at lunchtime break, Mm -hmm. I want us to be able to take a tour. Oh, I bet they would be fine with that. Right, because you talk about state of the art. But I think that having the lab technicians there at the course is huge. It's invaluable. Because we talk about all the time that you need to be able to understand what your lab is doing. Mm. And so you'll have not only the restorative side and Mm. the hands-on on on our side, Mm -hmm. but you'll have lab technicians there who've done... (laughs) thousands of these who can actually say to you, here's what we do on our side. So you understand if there are problems from the lab side, what you need to be looking for. So, I mean, I really think that we have engineered this course to try to be comprehensive for, uh, and you don't have to place implants to take this course. Again, this is not a surgical course. Mm -hmm. If you're driving your own implants, great. If you're working with a surgeon, great. Mm -hmm. You know, this is for anybody interested in knowing uh, what you need to know to be able to successfully pull off full arch uh, implant prosthetics. I feel like after this course, you're going to walk in Monday morning, and if the a full arch case, you know, walks in, yeah, you're going to actually know what to do. Yeah, you're going to know what to do, and, and you'll get- even have some ideas of patients that maybe want to transition to this over time. Mm-hmm. How do you go through long term provisionalization with teeth? and jumping them over onto implants over time. Oh, so amazing. it's going to be really, a, I feel like it's going to be a comprehensive case. It's, it, I feel like we're going to have a lot. The only challenge with this course is going to be a lot of information. Right. But that's what you need. If you're going to come and spend your day with us, you want to come out of there feeling like you got your mm-hmm. money's worth, and I think you'll feel that yeah, way. Yeah, there'll be three ring binders. Yeah, you there'll know? be some binders. Yeah, involved. there'll be some binders involved. Yeah. Say, listen, so hey, sign up. Sign up for the course. I can't imagine even getting it for this value, but we're offering it to our listeners that head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now, forward slash specialized. Yep. Scroll to the bottom of the page, and guess what, John? We're offering this course to our listeners for seventeen hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Now, listen. I mean, I don't know where you can go for seventeen hundred and fifty bucks. I don't think you can go anywhere. And get this information. And in a way, and do hands on, and do hands on, yep, right, hands on model conversion, all the stuff that yeah. we've been talking. The reason about. we can do it is because of Dental Crafters Network yeah. being at their facility. They're they're able to help us with costs from the lab standpoint mm-hmm. because they're there supporting us. And how many of these cases do you have to do to make back the seventeen fifty? Probably not very many. <laughs> Probably not very many. <laughs> we'll just stop right yeah, there. Yeah, we'll just stop right there. Well, so you go know, sign up. One of the reasons we 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 brought Chris Mahan and Associates on the show, and particularly Chris, um, is because of his knowledge of dentistry, mm-hmm. and he understands what a course like this could do for a practice. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, you know. Whenever you're looking at numbers, you start to look at numbers and say, "Did this." 
clinical procedure really makes sense in my practice. Right. And um, it's one of these things that I think it's important to look at too in business is do courses like this make us money? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, we're helping patients. I get that, but it comes down to business. Yeah, you that, have to, it has to make financial that's sense. That's why we took a little break here from some of our normal <clears throat> conversations is to bring someone on that may be able to help uh, some of our listeners out. Sure. And uh, because p- dental business advisors have helped John and I achieve the things that we want to achieve in our practice and in our family lives. And it's been good. It's yeah. Been really yeah. Good. So after a little a quick uh, break and a message from our sponsor, we'll pick right back up uh, with Chris Mahan and our interview with him in the second part. This is Justin Goodbread, and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. We plow through several topics to help you grow the value of your practice. Today we're looking at sales. Now I know what you're thinking. Dude, Justin, I'm not much on selling. Hey, I get it. Most dentists aren't very good with sales, but if you're serious about growing the value of your practice, you actually have to be. And the best way to improve your sales ability is to go through some sales training, which can help you improve your sales skills. In fact, we have a post on financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist that refers to the top books that teach sales techniques. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'd be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, welcome back, and uh, this is another episode that I've been looking forward to, John. It's good to have Chris Mahon of Mahon & Associates in out of Nashville, Tennessee, back with us to talk about key performance indicators, and I'm super excited about this because I know there's some things that I haven't been looking at that I need to be like diving into deeper. John, you've been a spreadsheet guy for years. Oh yeah, I and love I've, and I've got the key old performance Sally McKenzie. Man. Yeah, the Sally yeah. McKenzie spreadsheet. I've had it, but I've only been tracking like small things. Like, yeah, you tr- you track your total production, you track your you know adjusted, and then you track your collections. And you track how many new patients, and maybe you know, I've how got much this I- beautiful. You've got it. You've got an interesting one <laughs> that, I, and I give credit to Sally McKenzie because I learned it from her, but. I started tracking it when I was an associate, when I could get the numbers of how the practice was doing. So I have like 10 years now of production and collections and hygiene pay and all these things that I've been looking at. And as I've number one, gotten better at understanding what I have to do, but also had advisors that have helped me understand what I need to do. you can go back and see it. And I love it. And once a month we meet and we just talk about all these. I just, I love spreadsheets. I have a spreadsheet problem. And, uh, and Chris, I think Chris. has a spreadsheet problem too. I know Chris has a spreadsheet and, problem. And I, that's one of the reasons we get along so well is because Chris, what I love about Chris Mahan is we can, we can talk about philosophy of dentistry with Chris, as you guys know, if you listened to the last episode and, and that's good stuff. And we may get into some of that today. But today's show is more about the spreadsheet. It's more about, okay, so how do you know? Because this every, I guarantee you, every dentist owner wants to know, how do I compare? I mean, let's just, let's just call it, whether it's fantasy football or it's, you know, your, your, your favorite team you follow or it's your bowling league you yeah, go what, to. What you do last month in yeah. production, John. Or it's your, how much horsepower does your car have? Everybody wants to know, like, how am I doing and how does my practice compare mm. to, like, the industry standard, to my buddy down the road, to my zip code, blah, blah, blah. So, Chris, first of all, welcome back. And we're looking forward to hearing about, basically, how do we figure out how a practice is doing? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, John West, thanks for having me back again. Uh, very excited uh, to go through our spreadsheet problems together. <laughs> <laughs> Work through the problems I think, together. I think, this, I think this may be an intervention, but hey. Yeah, first you have to admit you have a problem. That's right. That's the step one, That's right? right? And I'm admitting I have a problem. <laughs> but, you know, you know, the, the key performance indicators are really where you can take information and turn it into application. 
right? Mm. It's taking, you know, everybody, you know, everybody can print off their QuickBooks P and L and look at, you know, their, their revenues and their expenses. And that's something that's very important. You need to do that on a regular basis to track those things. But, you know, Tony Robbins said, knowledge is not power. Knowledge is only potential. Action is mm. power. So how do you take that information on financial statements and then your practice software uh, reports and turn it into and make it meaningful and more importantly, actionable? How do you mm-hmm. use that information to create an action plan that will make your practice better versus just, you know, retroactively tracking, which is a lot of what accounting is, is just look at the P&Ls, but taking the, that historical data, forecasting and being able to improve your practice performance, uh, productivity and profitability as you move forward. Mm. That's a really good point, because I think that the, the we talk about comparing, right? So you can compare and I'm sure you got people all the time ask you, hey, Chris, how am I doing? Mm-hmm. But in the end, if the answer is not so great in this area, then I think we get into this kind of paralysis with that sometimes where like we have all these numbers and we kind of know the first, we want, like you, we want you to tell us everything's great. Right. Like we want you to say, oh man, you're crushing it. You're just, you're, you are destroying your, you know, this is amazing. But what happens when you say, you know what, this is an area that maybe we need some improvement. Well, it, that, that you, you got you got to be willing to you got to know how to put that together. And I, I almost you, feel like that's a whole different show. You know, it's I tell a, you, it's recently a, I had somebody tell me some things, and and I I looked at that person and I said, man, it's like I'm kind of scared. Hmm. And and I told you uh, what was it that I told you, Chris? That that person told me that this that what is it that I said I was scared, and you said there was something that somebody told me, and I told you about. It. Oh yeah, it was the the uh, Star Wars, the Yoda, the Yoda comment. You know, you know yeah. what is it? Fear breeds anger, and anger brings emotion, and you know, and, and that brings action. You know, <laughs> there it mm. is, right? That's good. It's the, it's so the, if you're not Jedi. being scared, <laughs> right? Uh, we had to bring Star Wars into this, right? Because well, December twentieth, December twentieth, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, we're all we're all ready. Yeah. Can I just yeah. say? Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt the show for for about thirty seconds because I want to tell you something beautiful. Okay. okay. All right. So one of my specialists, Wes, you know about this because it happened a couple of years ago. One of my specialists locally, <laughs> he is renting out again an, the entire theater, like again uh, four or five, like he's they're. Okay, so Star Wars comes out on the 20th. Mm -hmm. The morning of the 21st, before the theater opens, Mm. he has reserved the entire theater. I'm talking like every eight different theater rooms Mm -hmm. in this ginormous theater. And all of his referrals are invited to come and watch Star Wars on the morning after it releases at whatever midnight that night before. I mean, you want to talk about how to get business yeah. <laughs> from the nerds, <laughs> yeah. man. Offer them free Star Wars. I'll rent out the whole theater. I mean, how can you not love that? That guy? is guerrilla marketing at this best right there. <laughs> truly, truly is. So, Chris, if somebody... So, okay, I, let's get right down to it because everybody wants to know what yeah. are <clears throat> the most important KPIs. Now, I know that you could make a case for probably 30 or 50 or even 100 <laughs> of these things, right? So, we Slow don't want to dive in... Because we could go there. I know you could go there. But let's say that someone comes to you and says, Chris, what would be maybe the top five, if if you can limit it to five, what are the top five KPIs that you would need to know to get a feeling for how a practice is doing? You know, in a nutshell, without diving into the specifics, can you can you give us some of those? And then I want to talk through, if we can, each one of those a little bit more in depth about what is the average or standard and then how do we determine that and how do we you know figure out where we fit in? Okay. Well, you know, some of these are tried and true and tested that have been around for a long time, but they're as important today as they ever were before. And, you know, the core KPIs that you look at are, you know, your gross collection percentage, your adjusted collection percentage, and your accounts receivable collection ratio, which tells you how fast okay. you're turning your production into dollars into your practice. So say that say that one more time. So you said our gross collection percentage, because mm-hmm. I'm making notes here to make sure we, we have all this right. right. Gross collection percentage. And then you said next was- Adjusted collection percentage. Adjusted collection percentage, because that tells you about your write-offs Correct. and those types of things. Okay. Yep. 
And then what was next? Your accounts receivable ratio, which is days and outstanding okay. AR. Um, okay. And so what we do, you know, with each of those is the gross collection percentage is your 12 month rolling or 12 month trailing uh, collections divided by your production. So again, mm-hmm. if you collected 850,000 and had a production of a million, you'd have 85% gross collection percentage, right? Okay. Um, adjusted collection percentage is taking your collections plus your adjustments divided by your 12 month rolling production. And that'll let you know, okay, if we're taking a 15% haircut on the gross collection percentage, are we accounting for it at least through adjustments, okay? Um, Okay. And then the accounts receivable ratio takes your current outstanding accounts receivable divided by your 12-month trailing average monthly production. And what those indicators give us is what kind of efficiencies are we realizing up front? Are we collecting the money to us? Are we collecting it accurately? And are we collecting it timely? And okay. those are, you know, all, those are all really, I'd look at that as section one or and out of the five, which are your collections and revenue cycle KPIs. Okay. Right? And there's a lot of different information those KPIs will tell us that will let us know, hey, do we need to get in here? Because, you know, again, all too often, you know, dentistry has become a lot more complex in its revenue cycle and how we, you know, submit claims, how we have to fight against insurance or do the right things to get timely reimbursement. And also accurate reimbursement. Um, so those are the things that we're there to watch, and also make sure that we're not working for free. And we're, you know. So before we move on to two, then let's dive in maybe a little bit more to those. So what are so give us some idea of what you want to see in those numbers in the gross collection percentage adjusted and the AR ratio um, versus you know what what are the standards and where are the where would they where where would you start to consider uh, some problem problem area? Gotcha. Well, you know, the gross collection percentage, watching that is just good to know what percentage of our production or UCR we're writing off. And if I see mm-hmm. that, if I see that below 90 percent, I'll ask, hey, who are we in network with? Who are we, who, what PPOs we're participating with? And if somebody says, man, I'm just in Delta, then I'll think, man, this is kind of a high margin of write offs that we need to go and mm-hmm. maybe do a deep dive to assess, you know, are we are we collecting everything we should? Are we just writing off patient balances, et cetera? Um, also in that gross collection percentage, um, that'll let you really look at and say, do I need to do a payer analysis and see how much I'm writing off per payer or per plan, right? Mm-hmm. And see where we're making money or potentially losing money. Because I think, you know, you and Wes both are familiar with, you know, they can make a change effective January 1st, 2020, that can be materially significant to your revenue cycle and your and your profitability that if we're not paying attention as we go, that can be a big, a big impact on our practice. Gotcha. So you're looking for ideally 90% or above being healthy. And if you see those numbers below 90, you start asking, okay, like you say, do we need to consider changing our insurance mix or renegotiating rates with our insurers? Or do we need to market more to attract fee for service type of patients or something like that? And and I guess too, you kind of have to know the area that you're in, right? If this is big city versus small town, that starts to affect some of what you see because you have to know what's your competition. If everybody's in network with everything, then it probably changes some of your benchmarks for that, I guess. Exactly. And you know, and I'm not as you know beholden to, it has to be 90%, but if it's below 90%, we definitely want to know why, right? Okay. Specifically why, because you know, all, you know, all too often, many times my front office teams at dental offices either have a big, you know, a big clinical background or they've been there at the front office in that office. And that is the most underutilized and underinvested position in a, in a dental office. You know, I don't see a mm. lot of offices going, I'm sending my front office to ADOC because they need to know, right? I think that that's been catching, catching a lot of uh, wind behind us, you know, behind the sales moving forward because they always say if, you know, if, if the front office is singing, the back, the clinical team is dancing, right? Mm. And so you want to make sure that they're empowered with the information to really, you know, ensure the success of the practice and the collection. So, you know, I've seen some as low as 70%, but they may be taking Medicaid, Medicare, right? But at least we identify it and assess it on that gross collection percentage. Now the case, now the the adjusted collection percentage is where it better be 95% or greater because after adjustments, we better be accounting for every dollar of production we're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So we watch that and track that, you know, benchmark it to your peers but also, as importantly, benchmark yourself to yourself. 
So, mm. You know, we talk about uh, default rates in, in credit. And what is, I mean, is there a lot of defaults in dentistry that's, that drives that either way? I mean, do you see that in some offices? You're talking about like bad debt expense? Well, let, yeah. Well, no. Like, let's say let's say they collected. You know, they're not collecting everything they should. You said you know ninety five percent plus should be where we should strive to be. Well, how many people are like not paying their dental bills, right? Do you, do you see that? What is the average? Well, uh, there's there's a couple of factors there. There there are factors that a you know they say garbage in, garbage out, right? So mm-hmm. we have to make sure that our our front office teams are empowered and walking everything out the correct way and collecting the right the, the appropriate way, so we have good data in to measure it. A, um, the default rate on dentistry is actually very low. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and if you have a big time, you know, and that's why we track accounts receivable and that AR ratio, that third one out of this whole revenue cycle KPI list, is because that lets us know. Are we turning around our production in 15 days or less? And if not, that's where it gets back to what you're saying, Wes, about, hey, man, are we collecting it fast enough or are we collecting it at all? If that accounts right, mm-hmm. somebody comes in today and they, they start a $10,000 treatment plan, how much of that money do you get in 15 days? Right. Right? Right. And if you're not, and, and you know, is the 15 day mark just because most of the time it's like, start a crown today, finish it in two weeks. Most of the time, is that kind of what you look at that? Is that why you're saying 15 days or is most dentistry finished within 15 days? Is that why you're saying well, that? Well, the 15 days is the typical turnaround with third party payers, Delta, Blue Cross, you know, Cigna ah. and the Guardian. That, so you're basing it on insurance. We're basing it on insurance because, you know, if they're fee for service, you know, technically you're not supposed to walk out production until time of service or completion. So, you know, even with crowns, if you do temporaries, you're not supposed to walk it out until until the the, the uh, permanent is, is placed. Or, or mm-hmm. um, So those right there, you should have your internal policies about collecting at time of service for your fee for service. On a $10,000 case, that's going to materially outrun any dental insurance, you know, annual benefit, right? Mm-hmm. But another way that a lot of practices, you know, have opportunities that they may not be recognizing is that some of these payers, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, uh, once they utilize their their uh, annual uh, allowance or prepaid insurance plan, uh, mm. they go back to full UCR. So if you're charging mm. twelve hundred a crown, but Blue Cross Blue Shield will reimburse you seven hundred, and you do two crowns and a profi, that third crown is not at the seven hundred contractual rate. It can be, it could be at that fifteen hundred dollar rate, and that's where. A lot of people potentially miss revenue stream opportunities, not paying attention to their contracts. And every single one of the payers' contracts are different and they're unique. And that's why you need, you know, you need to make sure you have copies of all those contracts up to date, on file, in your office, fee schedules updated to make sure you're doing the right thing. Because I've seen now you mentioned the 15 days. Um, it used to be longer, right? Is that right? Because of, of checks, paper checks versus now we've got EFT mm-hmm. type of payments. Is that is that what's changed that? That's 100% correct. The ACH and the EFT uh, remittance has really changed the ti- the timely uh, timeliness of getting money back and really, open, okay. and really opened up the doors to help us manage our accounts receivable effectively. Gotcha. Awesome. So you want to see the ratio then? What's your what's your accounts receivable ratio? You said you want to see that be what like what's the number you're looking for on that? The perfect kind of number is you know <clears throat> anywhere from you know thirty five you know point thirty five to a half. So if you know if we get you know point five, it means that I have fifty thousand dollars in accounts receivable and I got a hundred thousand dollars average monthly production, right? That would yeah. give me my point five. Mm-hmm. If you get better than that, that can be good. But if you go below 35, you know, 0.35, that lets me know there could be, could be some other issues at play. Because, uh, mm. you know, and those other issues can consist of, you know, never updating the, you know, if they don't update their their third-party payer fee schedules and they're walking out at a, at a lesser fee than they're getting reimbursed. I've seen a practice literally go from having 50 grand in accounts receivable and then I've gone through and looked at their KPIs and they have... 50,000 in negative AR and they just go, my front office team's doing great. And I'm like, oh, I know they're doing great, but let's double check that. And they were actually putting incorrect credit balances on patient accounts that shouldn't have been there. And you, mm. and so these three ratios really give us indicators 
to deep dive into a multitude of different things um, that can recapture, you know, revenue streams and make sure we're not setting up because, you know, the credit balances are what everybody, nobody pays attention to credit balances ever. You know, we're supposed to cut them every 30 days. That's right in an ideal situation. Um, typically, the only time people see the credit balances when they're selling their practice and their ARs at 50,000, it's really at 150, but they have 100 grand of credit balances. And that's not a fun negotiation to have the night before closing on selling your dental practice. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. You know, John, wasn't it years ago, and Chris, you might be able to answer this too, that they used to say that one to one was a goal mm -hmm. to shoot for, mm -hmm. and that most offices were like two to one, mm -hmm. like meaning they were at two times the amount of collections that they were producing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the day, it was like, hey, see ya, you can pay me when you can, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like everybody just walked out the door without paying. So, what, Chris, is that is that change? That sounds like it's changing, or it has changed. Yeah, I think it has. I think there's been more awareness amongst you know practitioners and, and, and dentists in their in their organizations to make sure that they don't end up in that situation that is historically can can be a problem, right? Yeah. So, point three five to point five of your total production um, in AR. In AR. Because you okay, so let's move. Let's move on to like kind of section two then. If that's section one, mm -hmm. uh, kind of give us what what would be your your second section of uh, KPIs we'd want to look at. Well, after you know ensuring that we collect all the money that we're producing, we also look at your production mix, right? We you know so you look at your production KPIs, and of mm -hmm. course you know the, the the very first one we look at is you know ancillary production to total production as a percentage, right? How much okay. are your and we def, and define the ancillary? Your ancillary are your hygienist, typically, your hi, okay. your hygiene teams, and or it can be your assistants or other hygienists that are doing specialty services that are doing okay. that are doing chair side production on patients, whether that's whitening, okay. sealants, fluoride, profies. Um, you want to see that percentage in the healthy practice be about thirty five percent. 35% of, of your total production should be made up by hygiene and or assistant production mm -hmm. that's not related to doc, not essentially non-doctor production. Non-doctor production. Exactly. In, in, a, in okay. an ideal model, now again, you have some you know, high producing doc, docs that their hygiene can't necessarily run with them. And we make those assessments and adjustments accordingly. I mean, when I have a doc throwing 1.2, 1.5, $2 million annually of production, their two hygienists can't keep up as a percentage, even though they're they're highly productive. Mm -hmm. So we take that into consideration. But most of the time, more times than not, it shows us that there's a huge opportunity for increasing or optimizing that ancillary uh, productivity, where that really can become you know a, a direct revenue stream to the to the profit margins of a dental practice operation. And and most of the time, you're going to find inside of that that it's these little things like you know, they're not taking anterior PAs or they're not doing fluoride and um, they're not, you know, maybe doing as much periodontal therapy as they should. And, you know, some people say they've got the healthiest uh, practice in the nation when it's really not true. Exactly. It's really, you've got, you've got very kind hygienists or, or, you know, you just not reinforce the basis of what you should be doing, you know? Exactly. And, you know, you're spending time doing other things and not reinforcing what sometimes is is appropriate for the Now that for the that thirty five percent, that's that's a lot. You know, how often do you see practices meeting that? Because that's I mean that seems like a pretty high amount. Most of the time, again, most of the time, seventy percent of the time they're not hitting that, and okay. and that's due to you know as Wes had mentioned, there's so many things that you know have been taught and you know. And, and, and documented through, you know, double blind, you know, peer reviewed studies that, you know, hey, this is a great standard of care that has just kind of been overlooked or, you know, pushed to the wayside that I think, you know, just kind of reinvesting in the foundation of what, you know, clinicians and hygienists already know is good for the patient, you know, over overall uh, oral health can really add a better levels of treatment and patient care, but also B, it can be more productivity as well. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, That's cool. Good. So let's let's go on from there. When you're talking about production mix, what else do you look at there? I look at uh, ancillary uh, providers' compensation to their overall production. Um, hmm. You know, again, to get seventy percent of the time, I can go to an office and it'll be 
hygiene production, 20%. I'm like, are they doing fluoride? No, they really don't believe in it. Are they doing perio? Yeah, when we see it, and they've done like, you know, you know, four quads of scaling and root planting all year, right? Mm. Um, so those are the things we look at in the production mix. But then more importantly, we look at it as a profit center. We say, you know, again, comparing to the, you know, the, 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 the sporting goods department at Walmart, how is that department doing profitability-wise? You know, are we priced correctly? Are our processes efficient? And are we given the best level of patient care that we can? And that's what we assess. And it ultimately comes down to how much you're paying. Because, you know, that targets anywhere from 33 to 35%. And here's the big thing that has not historically been the measurement that we're working on our KPIs in our Excel spreadsheets um, is uh, it's now it's not, it used to be, you know, compensation to gross production. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, even the third party payers were paying 95% of preventative. That's not the case anymore. So yeah. now you really need to walk your write offs off per provider. That, you know, you talk mm-hmm. about the garbage in, garbage out thing. A lot of practices will just put all the write-offs to the doctor or to a practice provider account where they need to be walking out those write-offs per the EOBs, per provider, per hygiene, per procedure. Yes, it's a little more legwork, but that information gives you the opportunity for power. That that right there is a great point. Let me tell you why, John. Let's say you're growing a practice, okay, and you chose to grow that practice by taking on another insurance, Mm-hmm. Well, guess what hygienist is going to get those new patients, you know, whether whatever it is. And if you don't write off based on provider, right, you're overcompensating possibly or she's working harder than she should be, right, and getting paid and actually getting the practice paid less. She may be getting paid a base salary or a base per hourly rate, which is most of the time what it is. And then, then guess who's getting screwed? The doc, yep. right? Yeah. The, uh, the practice owner or whoever the f- f- fee's going to, right, Chris? Exactly. That's exactly correct. And so that's a very valid point. And, you know, I see it all too often, especially in like with legacy providers. When I say legacy, like legacy hygienists, you know, doctor comes out of school, works five years, comes and buys a practice, and they inherit, you know, you know the, the awesome long-term tenured hygienist who got a dollar raise every year for 20 years, right? Yeah. So they're making yeah. 45 or 50 bucks an hour and they're producing 75. Oh man. And man, that's a tough cookie to crack because you don't want to keep them. They're a powerful and awesome asset for the practice, but we have to have that candid conversation going, Hey, look, let's all work together to find a solution to deliver better clinical care, better comprehensive clinical care, and hopefully turn this loss leader that basically the doctor is only making what they're doing with their own hands into a profit center for that entrepreneurial doctor. John, I've yep. found, I've found, okay, now the type, type of people that I hire, they care. I at least think they do, you know? And and I have found when you start sharing some of this information like we've done over the years, and you start showing how much write-off there is for certain procedures and certain things that we do, they start fighting for you. They start fighting for you. Like mm-hmm. the team goes to bat for you in a bigger way, whether it's on the back end, they're trying to get more reimbursement, or it's on the front end, and they're just telling the patient, hey, your insurance doesn't really pay for this. We're going to do some adjunctive services to make up for it, or we just can't treat you, right? It's okay to tell people, just can't treat you, you know, and turn them away. So are you working for nothing, right? And that's what I think Chris is helping us out with here. Well, I think you you definitely have to look at... um of different formula, uh, I think, you know, you're kind of getting at Chris is that, you know, you used to say if you were paying hygienists <clears throat> on a straight commission, you know, and they were being paid on commission only, um, which in some ways is the fairest way to pay somebody in some ways. Uh, but that all depends on how the practice is running, right? Whether that's fair, assuming the practice is running very well and the front office doing their job, Hygienists should be glad to be paid on on a commission, but that's another discussion. My point is, is that the formula used to be: you look at that, you say thirty three percent, that might be the, the right number, but mm-hmm. now you're saying that, and of course that was out of gross production. So then, how do you come up with compensation? Then, uh, if you if you're talking about more taking write offs into account, um, is there a formula that you think is industry standard with that, or does that really vary depending on uh, how much insurance the page, the practice has going on, or how do you figure that out? 
that's a great question. You know, it varies from practice to practice. If you're in a practice with a high PPO mix, um, sometimes, you know, compensation on, adjust, on adjusted or gross production may not be fair to some of the hygienists that, you know, like Wes was saying, if you take on XYZ payer <coughs> as you're growing your hygiene department and the new hygienist gets them all, but they don't pay as much for profies or, or SRP, then that hygienist could be unfairly, you know, uh, reflected on and compensated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have a high PPO mix, you almost got to take the blended hygiene collection percentage, and that's with, you know, Sally Veteran Hygienist that has all fee-for-service legacy patients coming forever, and, you know, and then, you know, Debbie New Hygienist that is taking on all the new payer, you know, uh, patients, and take that average, you know, global hygiene uh, collection percentage or, you know, towards that. And then you can compensate mm -hmm. them all fairly um, in, in that mix. And again, you mentioned, you mentioned Sally McKenzie, so I'll give her a little plug too, because I read her newsletters every week. You know, I mean, hey, um, I saw one of their blurbs on it uh, just recently where they set up an incentive plan looking at capacity. They didn't do it on production because sometimes, you know, that could be a, sometimes hygienists go, oh, all they care about is production, which is something that's important and easily, easily measured. But sometimes, you know, you want to find, you know, maybe an even further uh, why definition. And so, they came in and did an assessment, and they're running three hygienists that should, you know, that have, you know, eight hours of chairside time a day or the opportunity on average for 24 patients a day. And they went in and were like, due to cancellations and no-shows, they were average and seeing like 16 a day. So instead of mm -hmm. even making a hygiene incentive plant platform on, on just uh, production, they eliminated that equation and just did it on patient seen, saying, if our capacity is 24 a day and if we get to 20 a day, everybody gets, you know, 150 bucks or whatever the case may mm. be. Um, and they said that the, everybody got behind that from the front office to the hygiene team and they increased their capacity utilization or realization just based on measuring this is how many patients we need to see versus having a production mm. output, which I think is, you know, should be customized to each practice because, you know, I don't think anybody that comes in and just boilerplate cookie cutters, their, mm -hmm. their philosophy – or, or, or entrepreneurial advice or consulting on a practice without really getting to know that practice and that practice's dynamics, um, it's probably destined to fail. You know? Sure. So, Talk about the doctor and the production mix there. With the production mix on doctors, we like to look at you know, restorations per comprehensive exam, and then we like to look at indirect restorations as a percentage of total restorations, right? Hmm. And those are numbers that, again, we're not saying that you have to hit a certain target, but those KPIs give us a benchmark of saying, hey, what type of clinical assessment are we doing, right? What type of clinical performance are we doing in terms of me, you know, Chris Mahan, DDS, you know, wink, wink, I'm not a dentist, but versus all of my peers out there and where do I stand, right? You know, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm doing, you know, typically the restoration to comprehensive exam is typically a 0.75 to a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So if you do eight comprehensive exams, you're not going to do a restoration on every patient, but you're going to average anywhere from 0.75 to potentially one restoration against those total eight exams, right? So mm -hmm. you want to see if that's going on. And if it's not, we assess, you know, hey, what's going on? Maybe there isn't anything going on, but it gives us a KPI to really delve into the practice analytics, right? Not and then we look at the indirect as a percentage of total restorations to see, you know, candidly, are we just doing, you know, three and four service fillings on everything and is there a different type of you know is there a different type of course should we go out to spears and say hey look i need to start at level one come to spears faculty and watch webinars all day because you know, spears will you know he's going to be a, a five to one ratio kind of guy john coyce right. same thing right carter out at lbi same thing and those guys that get to the 1.2 1.5 are doing is this they have a higher i believe sometimes clinical standard but having that higher higher standard and actually applying that clinical standard and measuring how they're doing is what makes them very successful practitioners. Gotcha. We could go we could go down that path right now, John. You know, but yeah. I don't think we will. <laughs> no, no, we got to hold back on that one. We but that's a great back. point. It's a great that's point to to have another way of looking at if you're not hitting those numbers. It doesn't mean necessarily bad, but it tells you that maybe there's another step you could take to improve that by being more confident in your treatment planning exactly. and uh, and also knowing just how to talk to people i mean in yeah. the end a lot of this just comes back to knowing how to talk to people 
showing them clinical photography. These are the things that you know help us to understand that. So, so anything else in the production mix kind of category, Chris, uh, for that that you want to hit, or or do you, was that? Uh, tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's pretty much you know that's pretty much the tree trops on the uh, production uh, KPIs. Okay, all right. So what do you got? What do you got next? And one of the biggest ones that that we really look at is uh, attrition. I ha mm -hmm. I haven't seen a practice that we've gone in and done our our attrition KPIs on. To see, you know, that nobody watches the back door, or very few, right? Typically, their reactivation or their recall is when the hygiene schedule falls apart. Hey, go grab the big, you know, the big print off list that we did three months ago and start calling everybody. Get on the quick fill list, etc., which are good things that you need to do. So I'm not discounting that, but you know, once you look at really how many patients are going out the back door, I think it really brings into focus. Hey, let's guard that back door with our life because mm -hmm. many times I'll go to a, a, a practice and they go, man, I'm with XYZ marketing firm and they got my new patients up to 35 a month. I'm like, we're killing it. I'm like, that's awesome. But how many truly active patients did you start with and how many do you have? So, you know, measuring how much is going out the back door in an objective way um, is something that's very important that I, I found that every practice can find opportunity in putting in, incorporating into their day-to-day -day operation, uh, how to minimize that. Yeah. So you, so what do you, now when you say that, it's, does that mean that, um, is there a, is there a, it's not really like a ratio for that. Is there as much as it is you just want to see, you want to compare, is the practice growing uh, is new patient flow, is, should that be your focus? Because I guess people are going to ask you, well, how do I, people probably ask, always ask, I would guess, how do I get more new patients? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's what you're saying is it's not necessarily a number, but you need to be, if you're seeing your, your active patient count, say, is staying stable, but you're getting, you know, 35 new patients a month, well, that means you're, you're just losing 35 patients a month is what you're doing. Exactly. And, 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 you, and, and I, I think I keep hearing this, Wes, you know, we, how many times... Have we heard the same story uh, from, it seems like everybody, <clears throat> you know, everybody that has a software out there, for instance, in the end, one of the things that they're trying to solve is this problem, you know, of how do you know who is, who needs that phone call? How do you know who needs that email, that text message, whatever it is? Uh, essentially to, right now, the only thing that it is, it's the law of averages, right? I mean, all this software does is just play off like stats and statistics. So pick one, right, Chris, and just go with it and actually use it and use it mm -hmm. appropriately to train your team on it. And, and man, I, I, just, um, I just think it's something that it's interesting because I've never really tracked um, this out-the-back-door stuff because you don't – if you have a busy practice – you don't really have to, right. you know? Yeah, and you don't really see it either. I but, mean, you know, some of your best it. patients, guess what? Saw one today. It had been three years since she'd yeah. been there. She walks in, healthy new patient exam. She'd been to a dentist six months ago. Chris, she needed seven restorations, and she'd seen the dentist six months ago. And she's a reactivation. That's huge. She so already trusts me. So yeah. do you think software is the answer to this, Chris? I don't want to like go in the super high weeds, but is that something that that typically when you look at today, what we have? Because for years it was trying to find a way to call people or send letters or emails or whatever. But mm -hmm. now we have all these softwares available. Do you think that that's a solution or is it still more of the old fashioned way of sending postcards and sending you know, emails and just doing things on a, on a one on one type of basis. I think diagnosing and measuring, you know, what the true attrition rate is. I haven't found a software that does that effectively um, because, mm. you know, Dentrix, Eagle Soft, you know, Open Dental. Most time they'll measure active patients by patients that have been seen a number of patients that have been seen in the past 12, 18 or 24 months, which, yep. you know, I, we measure active patients with how many patients are actively involved in preventative and recare. That's how many people are continually coming in your office, right? Yeah. So if you take your total profit count for a 12 month period, and I typically divide it by 2.25, because you have some periodontal patients that are coming in more than once, and et cetera, new patients. That'll mm -hmm. give you a good baseline of kind of what your active patient 
count is. How many active patient bodies do you have, right? So we take that number for the prior 12 months, divide it, you know, plus minus the number of profies divided by the 2.25 of the most recent 12 months, and that's your over under. And then we take in your new patient count, and that di that difference gives you how much your attrition is. And so mm -hmm. whenever you're going a one to one ratio for new new patient to attrition, or even a better opportunity is when you have one new patient to one and a quarter, you know, attrition. That's when you can come in and say oh man, we definitely need that additional hygienist and we definitely need to make it part of our ongoing daily activity to keep these patients engaged. So yep. basically what you're saying is for every one new patient, that pa they're also reactivating 1.25. They could, they, well, they could be. Again, it's, it's practice specific, but anywhere from one right. to, you know, from even, even 0.75 to one and a quarter, that's kind of the danger zone. That's where you're sitting there spending all kinds of quan to get new patients in the door and we're not keeping our current patient base engaged or active in the practice. So, yep. you know, you want to have that lifetime, you know, patient relationship and return on investment with those patients, right? I patient guess so retention. Th the software question, I guess I was more asking, you know, there's all these softwares out there, right, to try to help with this reactivation. So, I mean, let's assume we know we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Is the solution for this typically some type of automated solution or is it is it the old-fashioned way of calling people or you know what, what do you typically i mean i and again i don't want to go into like i know it's absolutely practice specific but do you think that the software that's available these days is is doing a good job of automating that process yes i think that uh, the software has come light years down the road from whenever you know smile reminder started which is now solution mm -hmm. reach right that was kind of the first one then you had demand force, and now, now you got Lighthouse 360, and you've got Revenue Well, and you've got a multitude of those that really help the, the, the patient engagement and keeping them actively engaged with your practice, whether that's sending them birthday cards, Merry Christmas, Happy Thanksgiving, hey, it's this is what's going on in the practice. You don't want to inundate them because they don't want to know everything going on in your practice, but you want to stay connected on an ongoing basis, and that helps in itself in minimizing your attrition, right? Gotcha. Keeping them engaged gotcha. in, in, in your practice and, and knowing that, you know, you care about them and you're thinking about them. Also, on the on the reactivation, uh, you said, is it all automated? I think that you, basically two-thirds of it's automated, but I still think that personal phone call is something that's, you know, that's that's very important that you should, you know, you should consider because nothing like, you know, a, a phone call uh helps keep that patient engaged with somebody they may or may not have a relationship with that, at that practice. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I had a perfect system, I would want to know, you know, the year and one day birthday of whenever the last time Chris Mahan, the patient was in your office. And I would want to communicate that at your morning huddle because you never know that, you know, your dental assistant may be my cousin or maybe mm -hmm. in the same, you know, Bible study or kid plays ball together and they have a more effective opportunity to say, Hey, we were on, you were saw you on the list today. We need to get you in here. And I'm like, Oh yeah, my bad. Right. So hmm. I like to send the automated email. I like to send a postcard and I like to make a phone call. And with those three things, I think you can reactivate anywhere from 20 to 50% of your patients going inactive. And I've seen some practices incorporate these systems and reactivate up to 80% of the patients going inactive just because they're yeah. watching that wall. It's like Jack Nicholson, right? You need me on that wall, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about reactivation, there's one little tip you shared off camera with me about patient retention, actually making that patient feel bad for not showing up to their appointments. It's something that your dentist makes you do. Right. Right? Yeah. Tell, tell, share that story because that's really good. I like it. Yeah, one of the things that have, has been, you know, psychologically effective in, in minimizing cancellations and no-shows, because, you know, the worst three words in a dental practice are schedule fell apart, right? How many times <laughs> How many times do you guys go in the break room and you see your hygienist, you know, sitting there and you're like, yeah, the, the family, you know, we had three cancellations this morning and they're like, I know, what do we do? You're like, err. Um, now, that being said, Something that I've seen work, and my dentist actually does, is whenever I'm walking out of the office, they say, hey, what do you want your appointment? And they'll give me a pre-fillable card, and I'll put my address, my name, and my address, and the date, and I sign it. And, and two weeks before my visit, I get a postcard from myself saying, here's your reservation. And I'm like, oh, man, I did sign it. And there's a whole other level of commitment there. So that's something I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. 
I like it a lot. So when I cancel, I'm not only canceling on the practice, I'm canceling on myself. So there's a little bit. Mm. You know. mm. Man, you fail on yourself. <laughs> that's that's bad. I, I failed myself. I do, I do that enough. I don't need to do it on my dental appointment, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. good. That's good. All right, so what else you got in that? Attrition, is that is that the main part? Is that kind of on its own, or are there other things in that same area? Man, attrition is something, and it also kind of feeds into another one is capacity, right? Mm. Okay. A lot of practices, you know, you go in and you say, man, on a scale of, you know, zero to 100, of what capacity are you working at? And they'll go, oh, man, I am on, <laughs> I'm on, I'm on skates with my hair on fire every day. You would not believe how busy we are. It is nuts, <laughs> right? It's classic, John, right? Oh, I love right? it. <laughs> and again, it may seem that way, but a lot of times if you're, you know, if you're working through chaos without pre-planning, without morning huddles, you know, the chaos will, and, and just the feeling thereof will make you feel like you're running at 95%, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we've done in the past, you know, you do a time motion studies, just pick your top 20 procedures. This is the easiest way to do it. Pick your top 20 that most of the time, most of the time represent 80 to 90% of your total production anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's going to say, okay, from tip to tuck, how long does a prophy take? From tip to tuck, how long does a filling take? From tip to tuck, how much does a crown take? You know, get on average and assign a time unit to that. And then go back to your procedures by provider and multiply those 20 procedures, time those times those time units. And I'll bet you a hundred bucks it is way less than the total capacity opportunity that you have. Mm -hmm. And that comes from scheduling systems and processes to, to again, attrition, to, you know, minimizing no-shows and cancellations and all those types of things to say, yeah, it feels like you're working at 95%. What if I told you we could make it feel like 85, but you could increase your productivity by 20%, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So getting a true objective capacity assessment is something that I think is, uh, that could be very beneficial. Because again, well, I was in an office the other day. I mean, you know, they're talking about they've got the standard one hour blocks for hygiene recare, right? One hour, one hour, one hour. And I'm like, do you know tip to tuck how long it takes to do the typical 28 procedures, you know, from from walking, you know, from the from from the lobby to the lobby, right? On on those on those patients, how much time it takes? And the hygienist is like, yeah, it takes 36 minutes. I like, yeah, that's where I, I said 38, but 36. I'm glad to see a hygienist that actually cares and actually measures it, right? Hmm. But then again, you look, but then the whole, the whole thing is, well, you know, if I had help turning my room over, that would help, A. Or B, you know, I'm waiting on the doctor to come do the exam, right? There's ways to really stagger the schedule and structure the, the exam times, whether it's on the front end of the appointment or the back end or however you do those things to really give that opportunity to increase capacity. And I'm not an hmm. advocate of saying, oh, we're taking them all below an hour, but I'm just saying, let's look at that capacity utilization and see if there are solutions we can put in, put in place that ensure that, A, you're giving the very best patient care and they're not a number, right? B, that we're utilizing you know, our capacity to our advantage and, and giving as much you know, high-level clinical care that we can possibly. Yep, makes sense. So as we kind of, kind of, before we go into any more, I want to kind of like bring this full circle for a minute here because we've talked about a lot already. And... I, I would say that most people listening to this uh, have already heard something maybe they're not doing or maybe reinforce maybe something they're, you know, they want to do or, ha or are doing and you're learning some things here because I am. Um, but if how much administrative time does the owner or who on the team like provides this information, right? I mean, because... You're, you're talking about time studies. You're talking about reporting. We're talking about spreadsheets. But, you know, if we're the busiest practice ever and all we're doing is dentistry, drilling and filling back in the back, then who's actually looking at the business? Well, if it's the owner or the office manager, how much time do you need to set aside to even look at all this stuff? And if you don't have time or don't want to deal with it, then who's doing it? That's a great point. Um, I would go back to, you know, whether it's Tiger Woods or or any Fortune 500 company. Typically, you're going to have the most effective change bringing an outsider in to give you that objective assessment and analysis, okay? And more importantly, give you the solutions and the architecture of how you can ch and correct that. Just like a swing coach, just like Butch Harmon with Tiger Woods or you got McKenzie that goes into IBM, 
or a censure that goes into, you know, to Dell, right? They come in, they look at the processes, the opportunities, they put together an action plan, and then incorporate that into your day-to-day -day applications. So the initial assessments, I think a lot of times is very beneficial for a third party to do. However, if you have the time, you know, again, what we spoke about tonight, we've given you all the, or, you know, given you all the, how the calculations are done. So if you have that Excel spreadsheet already, just make some tweaks and start tracking that data, right? Mm -hmm. I like to spread it across, you know, the team members. I like, you know, I like your clinical team to have to, you know, to have to track certain things. Uh, it brings buy-in and it also gives them meaningful information to share at team meetings, monthly team huddles, and those kind of things. So I think the more involved and incorporated you can get the team in doing a lot of this um, and working towards a collective target uh, is how it really takes hold versus coming in and saying, you have to do it this way. You know, we build solutions collectively. We try, we measure them collectively so we can see how our solutions are working and keep moving forward. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, what we've tried to do is, you know, when we meet monthly with my, you know, business team, for instance, you know, we have each we got, I think it's 33 things on our spreadsheet that we go through mm -hmm. <clears throat> and at each one of them is assigned to a person. Right. And it's spread out through three people in, that are in this meeting and then me. So I'm, I, I don't, I'm not responsible for any of it. Right. You know, that's one thing I've learned to be, that I've learned over the years is you just can't, as Wes said, you don't have time to, to be, you, you, your job is, it depends on your, how you want to manage your practice, obviously. But the main job I feel like I have is to be there to be the vision behind what's going on right. and not to be the uh, manager of those things because I don't have time to, I don't, I, I'm not up front hearing what's going on a lot of times and I'm not in the hygiene room all the time. So anyway, you know, we'll have one person report on the top of those first 10 things and, and that's their responsibility. It's their job to say, well, okay, so what's, what was our gross production last month? What was our... You know, uh, how, how many new patients did we have last month? And if those numbers are not good, that person should have an explanation right. as to as to what they at least think about that. You know, have an, and to do some research ahead of time. And, and if, if they said, don't, Chris, they're fired, creates, right, John? If they're fired, and if they don't, they're immediately, immediately. fired they're and fired. walked out the door. Yeah, yeah, I go through a lot of people. No, so I, I just think you got, you got to have some kind of, uh, in the end, you have to have buy-in, as Chris said. Yeah. And you also have to have accountability. And I think that's the thing is there has to be at the end of the day, somebody who says, if the AR is getting out of hand, who's, who's in the end responsible for that? Well, some of that, yeah, me, I guess in the end, in the end, but there's gotta be a person who I can say, Hey, what do you think's going on here? And know when to call somebody uh, for help. If we, if we can't figure it out ourselves, I found it interesting too, Chris, that this whole time with all these, these KPIs at no point, have I heard you and maybe maybe you haven't gotten there yet but at no point have I heard you say a thing about controlling costs really right you know like because I think people get really focused on supplies or labs or how can I decrease my costs somewhere but what I'm hearing you say kind of over and over again here is not to ignore that stuff, but you're, you're focusing more on what you say the word is opportunities. How can we increase our production? How can we uh, be more efficient? And I think, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of dentists are so focused on how can we save money on things. Right. Well, I think they're both very important parts of the balance beam, right? You know, but, you know, key performance indicators are about your performance as a business operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, expense tracking is as important. I mean, they say, you know, a dollar saved is $3 earned, Right. Hmm. Which I think, you know, you know that I'm a champion of, of, of uh, efficient business operations. I think that's sure. really something that's that's um, that's very pertinent and mandatory in running a successful business. But the thing with that percentage, which we track on a monthly and quarterly basis with our clients and we benchmark them to their peers in the industry and to themselves saying, hey, your employee costs are running at 30 percent. Industry average is 27 to 29. We want to target at 25 percent. But does that mean we're going to go cut somebody? I like to look at both sides of the balance beam going, no, you don't have to cut a position, but let's try to get that top of the line. If we get those revenues up, the percentage mm -hmm. falls in line. So there's different ways yeah. to control those percentages is what I'm saying. Do you think people have, in general, more problem with one side of the balance beam versus the other? Like, what do you typically see that you're having to focus the most on? Is it how can we get the top of line things up, the performance up? 
versus uh, dealing with decreasing the cost on the other side? I think that managing the cost is easier to do just from a, you know, just a, a, it's a blanket standpoint because you can go look at your, 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 your vendors. And, you know, again, that's what I always say. I'm like, Hey, look, if you're, if your labs are running at 12% of your revenues and they say, well, I use this high end cosmetic, you know, Kois lab. Well, that's good. Well, you need to charge them Kois prices. So the percentages come in line. Right. And, and I'm using that as an example. Um, so I think that man, managing the expenses are easy, easily done. I think it, mm-hmm. I think improving the productivity is where it really cut, takes a, a gut check, so to speak, saying, are you ready to make a significant business operations change to how you mm-hmm. do things and how your ancillaries yep. do things and how we hold them accountable? But, you know, you mentioned something that, you know, that there's a book about Disney called Delivering the Magic. And that's all they said is if you want to have accountability and buy in amongst your team members like Disney has, it's all about key reports. So, John, you're doing a perfect thing in having the team bring those key reports and, you know, one of the things that, you know, Suzanne Black of Dental Boot Camp, formerly Walter Haley, worked with Suzanne for, for, uh, for a long time. Um, you know, she says, and Walter Haley, you know, itty bitty used to say, when you bring me an ch- uh, opportunity or a problem, bring me two solutions and a free one. Right. Mm. So, again, as long as you have that accountability where they're responsible to bring in that, that data to you. That goes back to, to Wes's point, you know, saying, well, how do you do that? Well, again, I think a lot of times a third party is necessary to assess what's going on. And then yeah. whatever, you know, you, you have a whole different dynamic per practice of skill sets that can, you know, you can say, cool, I got this, right? And yep. so our job here is done. Well, how many patients show up to your office, you know, that automatically know what they need to have done when it comes to the dental, you know, dentistry that, that they come for, a broken tooth, whatever? They're coming to you for an objective opinion, mm-hmm. right? And and sometimes I don't think we treat our businesses the same way because we're so proud of like what we're trying to achieve. We have the busiest practice. We do the veneers, the crowns, the implants. Look at all the things that we do. And I'm, my schedule's jam-packed full. And yeah, look at all these numbers and stuff. But you know what? Humble yourself to bring in somebody to scare you, right? Mm-hmm. To scare you a little bit and to actually offer you some objective advice. And I think it's one of the greatest pieces of advice that, you know, that if you're listening to this right now and you really want to take it to the next level, Mm -hmm. that might be what you need to do is you need to bring in somebody that's objective and just sit there and listen to them after they objectively look at your practice and say, either you're killing it or you've got some areas you need to improve. Yep. And here's where we and every, think the And everybody's going to have areas to improve. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that's yeah. the thing. Except for you know, John. Everybody's, Except for John. Because right. he's got well, like a spreadsheet uh, with like 30, 30, 30 rows oh, on it. Oh, yeah. And that's why. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and all of those numbers are always perfect. Right? <laughs> yeah. Every single one. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, right. So, I Chris. Mean, it's, Sometimes the mo the more you have on that spreadsheet, you know, like the more stressful it can be. Well, analysis you know, and that's, paralysis, right? Yeah, I mean, like, exactly. And and that's the value of having somebody, as you say, that that can kind of read through those numbers. Because that's why I asked you, Chris. Tell me the things that you kind of really look at, because there's so many things you can measure, and they're all useful. It's all useful, but there's certain things that you need to focus on first and second and third, and that's the value of having somebody who has been involved in practice management, who has seen kind of what works, what doesn't, and cannot, it's not about necessarily, yeah, you need the data first, you gotta have that. But then you gotta say, okay, what do I start with? What do I, and then too, it's about what are you willing to start with? What are you, how much are you willing to do? And, and what are you willing to change? And, and I, I, I think that that is, everyone should be challenged to be willing to look at you know, what's going on objectively because if you're not doing that now, I know I wasn't always doing that. If you're not doing that now, I guarantee you, you know, it's going to pass you by and you're going to be wishing that you had been doing that earlier. So I guess what, as we kind of close here, you know, Chris, tell us a little bit about if, if people want to get you involved with what they're doing. You know, you're, we're hearing here about what are some of the things you look at. Obviously, tell us a little bit about what you do and your organization does with dental practices in order to help them to see these things and then help them to come up with a plan and kind of tell us a little bit about how they can get in touch with you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, our, our firm at Mayhan and Associates is you know, we're multiple service, multiple discipline under one roof. So we tie in all the business applications, whether that's tax strategy and immense tax savings, financials and the financial statement prep and review, 
But our financials are different because we already have a lot of these KPIs built into our standard financial and management report, you know, sets that we review with our clients on a monthly or quarterly basis. So we turn this into something we watch on an ongoing basis just from the financials engagement. Uh, and then we also have something called a practice, practice opportunity analysis that, man, every time we run one of these and we look at attrition, perio, fluoride, treatment acceptance, that's one of the KPIs we didn't talk about, that if you just manage how much treatment's diagnosed in the back from the hygiene chairs and the restorative chairs, how much actually gets scheduled and completed, a lot of times there's a fortune there because you guys are hustling. You know, whenever that patient's in the back in the, in, the, in the chair, they're like, oh, yeah, I definitely need to do this. But when it gets up front and they're, you know, and they're not, you know, there could be a disconnect and you never see that patient for three years. Right, Wes? Right. Mm. Right. Mm. And so that being said is treatment acceptance is another KPI. But there's something we do to, as a practice opportunity analysis. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't pay for the cost of that opportunity analysis by, by 10 times, 10 X, <clears throat> I'll give it to you for free. And then mm. you can take it and do what with it what you want saying, oh, I might want to adjust my fees. Oh, I may need to look at my payer mix. I may need to look at my attrition. I may need to look at my, my fluoride, my perio, my cancellations, my capacity, and those things, and just see what's on the table with a light switch, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times I've had, you know, uh, acquiring doctors or groups that have us run these opportunity analysis on practices that they're looking at purchasing. Because there's nothing like purchasing a business and having turnkey light switch $200,000 of increased revenues by just changing a few incremental things. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, the, yeah. and the one warning I would ever give out there is, you know, once you look for those third parties, be very, uh, you know, uh, keen to, are they giving you a customized blueprint based on your practice specifics? Because if they tell you mm. blanket, you know, carte blanche, raise your fees, cross the board, get out of PPOs, and hygiene is a loss leader that I would probably ask for a second opinion, <laughs> right? Yep. Because it's not all things to all practices. Some practices have to have 10 PPOs. And I'll tell you this, some of my most profitable practices have the lowest gross collection percentage, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it's not all, you know, it's not a one size fits all glove that needs to be really, you know, assessed on a practice by practice basis. Mm. That's good. Well, man, this has been awesome. I mean, awesome. this is the kind of thing that you can take first of all, directly and start learning and looking at some of these things. But I think pretty quickly, again, no matter who you are, it gets a little overwhelming. So you need to find somebody you can trust and you need to find somebody. Yeah. You need to find somebody who, who will scare you a little bit and, and make you really think about what's going on. And so if you want to get, if you want to learn more uh, about what Chris is doing, mayhenassociates.com, uh, and uh, you get in touch with him, give them a call, find out what they can do for you. Um, and again, we're not, we're not here just to plug that. There's lots of good people, you know, but what we think here is that, you know, obviously you can tell uh, not every day you meet somebody who's not only doing the practice management side of it, but also the tax side of it, tying that in. That's huge to me because, gosh, there's such a, such a crossover between those things. Right. So. Yeah. You know, we think you should, you know, if you want to learn more about what Chris is doing, I think you're doing a good thing. I think you're you're helping us to understand where we need to go and trying to do the kind of practice things that Wes and I are doing as we talk about on the show all the time. It's really not the first thing we think about. The first thing we think about is not, okay, well, how can we make more money, right? I mean, that that comes a lot of times through good quality care, but, you know, we're like, okay, we want to do this quality care, but you still have to be understanding how does that actually work out in the back here and what's going on? And is it really making sense from a business standpoint? You got to have somebody who can keep you honest. That's right. And I think that's the, that's the type of thing we need, especially the more passionate you think you are about all the, all the clinical stuff we do. You want to be able to be passionate about that and take up a lot of your mind space with that and not, and have other people that can help you understand the business side of it if it's not something you have time for, not something that is your passion. So thanks for coming on and being with us, Chris, and hanging out and teaching us a lot about you know what is really important to look at. And uh, I, I think this conversation is going to have to continue some more. I think there's definitely some more stuff we want to talk about with you as we talked about before the show. Uh, so we'd love to have you on another time. Hey, most definitely. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks, absolutely. Chris. And so if you're listening to this, you like what Chris is having to say, you're interested, you want to give us some feedback, tell us uh, what you were wondering or tell us what your biggest struggles are with your practice um, from a business side or from a practice management side. Connect with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, and definitely, if you're appreciating what The Dental Guys is able to do for you, 
Uh, check us out uh, on iTunes, podcast, Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star review. That is huge for us. It helps us to get our message out. Remember uh, that we're going to be at the Academy of Austin Integration meeting coming up next March. Uh, so yes. definitely, if you haven't already signed up for that, get signed up for that uh, so we can see you out there at the meeting and hang out. Uh, it's been another great show. We, we really uh, love the balance that we kind of get to have here talking about not just the clinical dentistry, but also anything else that can make our practice kind of take it to the next level. So for Wes, for Chris, I'm John, and we are The Dental Guys.